Welcome to the Digital Chameleon Camcast, where we discuss the emerging trends, tools, and best practices with media and marketing leaders across the online world. In this Camcast, Digital Chameleon's Deb Taylor talks to Joe Polizzi of the Content Marketing Institute about moving content center stage. Hi, Jay. Um, thanks so much for being part of Accelerate Brand Publishing. Um, perhaps first of all, we could start with um, a little bit about yourself um, and also the Content Marketing Institute's work. Sure. No, happy to be on today. Really appreciate it. Uh, so, Joe Polizzi, um, I've been either selling or preaching or teaching about content marketing for over uh, 10 years now and used to actually sell it when it was called custom publishing. And then, of course, we've seen a lot of things change in the past dozen years, and now everybody calls it content marketing, which is great uh, for us because we've been using the term for a long, long time. And um, let's see, I wrote a couple books. One is Get Content, Get Customers, which is sort of an intro into content marketing. And then most recently with Robert Rose, wrote a book called Managing Content Marketing, which is sort of a how-to, more of a tutorial guide for, for brands to try to figure out how to actually manage the content marketing process. Um, launched launched now five years ago what has now become the Content Marketing Institute. And uh, we're over here in the States uh, putting together um, the largest content marketing event in the world called Content Marketing World. We do a magazine called Chief Content Officer Magazine, which we actually have a version, uh, Australian version as well as that. And uh, we have daily content every day on contentmarketinginstitute.com, all about the how-to of, of content marketing. So we just anything about training, how-to, education around content marketing, we want to make sure that we're in the center of that. So obviously, as you say, you've been involved with this from, from the beginning, if you like, um, um, when it says sort of change from custom publishing into content marketing. Um, how do you personally define content marketing? I think it, it so it depends on where you're at in the life cycle, but let's start with the basics. If somebody's just trying to get a feel for what content marketing is, I usually explain it very simply in saying content marketing is basically thinking and acting like a media company would, like a publisher would. What does that mean? It basically means instead of doing things tr- more traditionally like you would where um, I'm going to advertise or I'm going to sponsor something, I'm going to try to um, get somebody's attention while they're engaging in a piece of content. Let's say I'm going to advertise in a magazine or a newspaper or whatnot. What we want to help brands understand is to actually create the content that's compelling and relevant, be the news source, if you will, um, be the engaging piece of content. So it's a whole idea of creating valuable, compelling, and relevant content on a consistent basis to do one of two things. One is either to attract customers, or two is to retain customers. So um, as we've seen over the past few years, the barriers to entry to doing content marketing have, have really come down. I mean, anybody can you know publish content on the web today, but there's more challenges than ever in actually creating quality content and actually structuring this in an organization. So we're working with a lot of large brands that – are actually having a lot of pain in doing that. It's not easy to change what we've been doing over the years to actually uh, figure out how to execute content marketing in an organization. I was going to ask what, what the barriers to, to marketers um, embracing content marketing are, um, and you sort of detail some of them there. Are there, are there any others that you think? Yeah, I mean, no, it's, a, it's a good question. The, really, the, ba- the barrier to entry um, I don't know if this, I mean, maybe you see this in, in Australia, but the, the biggest thing that we see is actually change. It's, it's, it's the barrier. It's, it's, it's dealing with people that have done things the same way for a long, long time, and they don't want to do things a little bit different, even if all the po- everything's pointing to that direction. So that's the biggest thing we see where we're dealing with uh, marketers that have learned on the four Ps and learned how to do things one way, and with the advent of social media and um, of course, content creation possibilities, new technologies, and really consumer behavior changing in such a way where we've got different, they've got different screens, they're getting information through um, everything that they've got uh, at their disposal. Um, thinking a little bit differently about, boy, how can we create um, information that's going to take our customers to the next level, either make their jobs uh, better and make them better at their jobs in some way, make them better, have better lives in some way. Uh, create more enriching content. So that's the biggest barrier to entry. I think the other thing is that most companies that we deal with are set up in silos. And so there's content created in all those silos, whether it's um, email marketing, uh, social media, public relations, communications, marketing, sales. 
that's very siloed approach and to be effective in content marketing you need to break through those silos and it's if you if you're a company that's been around for a long longer time break it through those silos is easier said than done and so what we're seeing right now we're just at the advent of this this is this is at the start of a process that's going to take a long long time to get through um, it's not that traditional marketing is is bad. We still are a proponent of traditional, but we you know that to be an effective marketer today, you have to have a really good portion of your resources and investment going toward content creation and distribution. Um, Seth Godin, another sort of content marketing guru, I'm sure you're aware of, um, has said that content marketing is the only form of marketing left. Is that do you, do you agree with that, or do you think that will be the case? Well, first of all, I love the statement, but I don't <laughs> agree with it. I don't agree. <laughs> I think that traditional marketing um, will be around for a long, long time and probably always. I mean, what we see with disruptive uh, marketing opportunities is the old ones never go away. They just change. I mean, radio never went away. Print is not going away anytime soon as far as I can tell. Um, engagement is still up across the board. It's just that we're, we're engaging in more pieces of information, whether that's the iPad, mobile device, even print, in your laptop, whatever the case is. So I think that content marketing has to be getting more attention for wherever you work, whatever brand you work with, and we're seeing that across. I mean, we're basically seeing budgets over here. About 25% of budgets are are sent to um, in the marketing budget are for content creation and distribution. So we're seeing that that's a big number. That's a big portion of the marketing, but that still means 75% is to do other things because sometimes you know sometimes you need traditional marketing to get awareness, to get somebody's attention on that. But then when somebody gets attention, then they're going to do all that research. That's where content marketing comes in because they start doing research. They start to type in certain things into Google. They ask their social networks. Um, they, they start checking their email newsletters. They're looking at PDFs or they're downloading books to get more information so they can make a buying decision. That's where really content marketing comes in. So I actually believe that traditional and content marketing can work hand in hand. You've, you've said yourself that we're all publishers now. Um, what are the things that you think brands need to do to change that mindset they have or to transition in, into publishing? I would, when I ask CMOs to do that don't believe in this, I just simply ask them, how do you behave when you look to buy a product or service? Like if you're going out to buy a car, what do you do in that process? You, um, I mean, let's see, because I just did this. I just went and bought a car. What do I do? Well, I go research online. I'm typing all kinds of things into Google. I'm going to Edmonds. I'm going reading up on blogs. I'm downloading all this different piece of information. So before I actually went and purchased the car, I knew exactly what I wanted. I knew where the car was, and I went in, and I, there was nothing to be done. I knew exactly what I wanted, just negotiating the final price with the salesperson. That's it. I knew everything. I got all that information. Here's the point about we are all publishers now and why it's important. Those people that didn't, didn't, didn't get in in my buying decision-making process from a content standpoint, they're left out of the process. Um, and it, it's going to continue to happen that way. Let's say you're a B2B company. If, I mean, it takes months sometimes to make a buying decision, and you've got about seven people making that buying decision. You're, each one of those people are engaging with ten or more pieces of content during that buying decision-making cycle. If you're not part of that content creation, and distribution, you p probably will get left out of the buying decision-making process, and we can't afford that to happen. So, and it's not even all about attention, right? It's all about retention as well. I mean, especially today in today's economic times, we've got to make sure that we keep customers as long as possible. How do we keep them loyal? We do that by telling them great stories and to, to create that affinity toward the brand and to help them become brand evangelists. That's what we want. And what? how do you do that if you're not talking to them every day, if you're not running into them in retail stores? You send them great, great information that they can take, engage with, and share with others. So what's, what's the one piece of advice you'd give to someone who's about to start a content marketing campaign who's perhaps not you know, very experienced in it? Uh, the first thing I would say is don't look at it as a campaign. Um, I would look at it as an ongoing commitment. Um, that's where most brands really get it wrong when they start on it. They think about it like you'd think about any other advertising campaign. Let's say that you're going to um, launch a blog, uh, you're going to launch a video series, ebook or white paper program, uh, whatever the case is, I mean, a mobile campaign. 
we think about it as a as a campaign as a that has a life cycle of 30 60 90 days whatever the case is but if you think of yourself as a publisher what you realize is that those things never stop if a publisher creates a magazine they send that magazine out every month if a media company creates an e-newsletter that e-newsletter is sent out either every day or every week always at the same time so content is a promise to your customers so i think the first thing is is Make sure that you understand that this is an ongoing thing that you need to resource. Um, the second thing is just make sure you ask yourself why. Um, either, I don't know how it is where you are, but over here in the States, the biggest issue that, that we see, even billion-dollar companies, they want to just do things because they think they should. They want to create a blog or they want to be on Pinterest or they want to do Facebook or Twitter or whatever social media um, of the day is is the hot thing. And we always want to go back to why are we doing this and how this is going to help the business? It's just like every other marketing program we're running where we have to have it set in sound strategies and objectives before we move forward. So I would just make sure that you go through it like you would normally, um, and then you resource it a little bit differently because content marketing, regardless if you're insourcing or outsourcing it, there's just so many more components um, that are involved because it's this ongoing process of creating something that's relevant and to do that, you have to be continually evolving that program. I mean, if you're any media pub, media company or publisher, you know that you have to take feedback ongoing every day so you can improve that product for the next day. And what, what would you say the most? Um, how, how important it is to actually match content with buying cycle stages, and also how you do that, and what kind of content that you found sort of really pushes people along that process. Yeah, I think it, it will. First of all, we know that about, at least over here in the States, about half of the companies do that. So we're still at a point where, where a lot of companies aren't doing that, um, setting it to the buying cycle. And I'm speaking specifically for B2B because that's more most of the focus are as to match content in the buying cycle. Um, I think it's very, very important because our customers are savvier than ever. Um, you're not going to hit necessarily – your customers that are ready to convert with attraction type content or you don't want to right you'd rather be more sophisticated and say well boy if they're ready to convert this is where we want to show them um, calculators or comparisons or whatever the case is um, at the beginning level uh, attraction stage we want I mean that would be great for blog posts um, to get them in or maybe ebooks uh, to get them into your system and then once you have that email you communicate with them then maybe it's an ongoing email newsletter or maybe it's a white paper program to get them over to conversion and then once they are a customer then what should it be you, you want things that they're going to love and share that might be some more social media content that may be facebook content because what we're finding in facebook is there that's more of the customers that know you and love you and that's you'd have that type of content um so i think that your your point about buying cycle is so critical because a lot of custom a lot of brands out there set it to the selling cycle how they sell and we really want to line up our buying cycle with our sales cycle it's so so critical and i think the problem really the reason why it doesn't happen it's hard it's really hard to do this you really need to get a marketing automation system that's going to make it work and then you have to get the resources for that content most brands have tons of content available like nobody's in a shortage of content we're in a shortage of really good st- a story, when I say storified content, or content that's told in a way that is actually engaging. Um, so that's where we're at a shortage of. So that's why the more journalists, the more storytellers you have in the organization, that you can take that content to the, to the next level, the better it's going to be, and then you can actually figure out the assets you have and then match it up with the buying cycle. So how do you, how do you see the future of content marketing say over the next five years? Boy, I I look about the next six months out. I don't know about you, but uh, five years is a long, long time. Um, I I really do believe in the next five to ten years. We're already seeing this with companies like Microsoft and Cisco Systems and Oracle and Dell and mostly on the technology side, where they've already set up news operations. They've already set. They're they're hiring journalists like crazy. This is not new. This has been happening for a year plus now. I think that um, they're first movers. I think in five years, uh, a marketing department will look and act very similar to a publishing department because most of the marketing we'll be doing is actually content creation. Um, Not that traditional marketing will go away like we talked about before. It it won't. There will still be opportunities for that. 
but that's more for attention, getting their attention. Uh, once we get their attention, they're going to go and they're going to search out more information, and that's where the opportunity exists. So I really think in five years you, you're not going to see a big difference between media companies. From I mean, there's a there's a difference in goals, by the way, and, and how the money comes in. But if you're just looking at processes and the types of people they hire, from journalists to managing editors, um, it's it's going to look very similar to the way a media company set up. There seems to be a lot of confusion over um, the differences between content marketing and social media marketing. Um, can you talk a little bit about that subject and, and sort of how the two, two differ and, and how they comp- complement one another as well? Sure. I mean, I, my take is is that um, I mean, social media marketing involves a lot of listening. Um, it's, it, they're obviously just for different social media channels available. But our take is is that Social media without having something interesting to say is not going to get you very far. So you better have a sound content strategy so that you can really leverage those social media channels. Now, a lot of people will argue that, oh, yeah, sure, it's uh, um, content marketing and social media marketing are one and the same, but they're not because content marketing is not just social media marketing. Content marketing leverages all the channels, including print and in-person. So if I'm a brand today, and we do this ourselves, I mean, I'm marketing – in social media, so I'm marketing using tools like Facebook and Twitter, and I'm on forums and doing blogs and those types of things, all social media, all social media marketing. That's great. Um, but I'm also doing email newsletters. I mean, that's integration with social media, but it's not really social media marketing. I do webinars and webcasts. It's integration with social media, but that's not social media marketing. Uh, we're doing videos. That could be everything, including social media. Uh, we're doing print magazines and print newsletters. Well, that's definitely not social media, at least not traditionally what we think of social media. Well, we do in-person events as well as, as content marketing. Well, that's not social media either, although it can be integrated. I think all these things have social media components, but I think if you back up and really look at it, what's first, what comes first, and what's central is what is your content strategy? What do you stand for in your market? What are you trying to accomplish to attract and retain customers from a storytelling standpoint? And then your channel strategy involves social media. So I really think that content marketing is more the core or central to the marketing department. And then social media is more of that distribution capability where you're going to look at that's PR and you're going to look at marketing and communication and email and social media and all that from a distribution standpoint. And is social media is still useful for, for listening before you start that content strategy? Oh, absolutely. Um, before you start any, I hope, before anybody starts any content strategy, they set up their listening posts. And the best listening posts around are social media, whether you're using Twitter, uh, LinkedIn Answers, Yahoo Answers, uh, any forums uh, on Facebook. Uh, you're, comm- you're listening, commenting on blogs using tools like, I mean, if you don't use Radiant 6 or tools like that, you need to use Google Alerts and other free tools as well. So um, absolutely critical. So, I mean, the, the difference is is that 10 years ago, when we used to set up our listening posts, we used to do surveys and focus groups and all this other stuff. We didn't have all these things at our disposal. Now the cost of doing upfront research has come way down, and we can do them much differently leveraging social media channels. Now how do you um, – obviously, you know, people develop their marketing personas and, and um, are quite, hopefully quite used to doing that. Um, and then you've got, you know, social media personalities, and it's quite confusing to try to match all that together. Have you any advice over that? You mean like when you set up a buyer persona? And yeah, like yeah. Some, um, I mean, I think the most effective companies at doing this are the ones that do set up the personas and they know who they are, and it's easy. It's much easier to do on the small business side. So if you're a small business and you have one or two products and you really do have three or four personas, you can really create a fairly effective content strategy around that knowing that you have a core asset and then one that then you take that content asset and you say, well, how can we apply that to each of these buyer personas wherever they're at in the buying cycle? And that's, rel- I mean, it's a lot of spreadsheet work and you have to have some really smart people to do that, but it's not rocket science. You can actually do that. You can see it happen. You can create the content. You can reimagine that content in different forms and you can get a lot of mileage at it depending on what your goal is. Uh, but I will I will shy away for a second to say that in a large organization where you're looking at multiple verticals, multiple products set, maybe a little bit of brand confusion, it's very, very tough to do that. So 
um, I would say <laughs> it's I'd say from a you you have to probably do all that's why we're seeing actually more uh, larger brands outsource because it's it is so difficult so as much support and help as you can get from a large brand standpoint um, to figure out it's just more of a complex sell in my opinion from a larger company standpoint. I mean look at Procter and Gamble for example so Procter and Gamble just I can give you three examples of what they do from their persona sets they have HomemadeSimple.com, which is their content platform for, like, moms on the go. They have BeingGirl.com, which is targeting adolescent women. And you've got ManOfTheHouse.com, which focuses on, like, dudes like me. And that's three personas that they focus on with a very uh, distinct content strategy. And you know what? They've got another 20 of those. So, I mean, there's a whole strategy, buyer persona strategy for each one of those. And that's just an attraction strategy for the most part. So, um, I mean, just <laughs> if you just think, just think about it for one second for this this whole conversation, the content demands that any brand has to go through today, we've just never seen anything like it. Um, I mean, it really, they are uh, unlimited, and it's just a resource issue at this point in figuring out, if, you know, going that direction. But see, the same, but and you're seeing actually Procter and Gamble at the same time. They're really looking at their spending on traditional. They laid off a ton of uh, people recently. They're doing a lot of restructuring here in the States, and they're looking at how much more social media and digital marketing um, leverage they can have in marketing and through sharing and whatnot. And that's, if you really read through what's happening, a lot of what they're doing is they're going to create more and more content so they can have that content be shareable and be leveraged so that they don't have to spend money on all that marketing through traditional. So. And so is there a trend there as well of um, you know content strategist officers and brand journalists, which is quite a new term over here? You know, are they being embraced by by companies over there? Uh, I'll give you a quick example and probably make the case for it. I had uh, I did a workshop a couple months ago with 13 technology companies, and every one of those 13 companies that we were in the content marketing workshop for had an opening for an in-house journalist, a content strategist, or a managing editor, which is unbelievable, right? You'd think that mm. a lot of journalist groups that I talk to, they're like, oh, you know, the mark job market's not good. And I said, the job market has never been better. You're just looking in the wrong place. I said, the, the jobs are not on the media side because we've seen what's happened there. The jobs are really on the brand side. Um, so, I mean, I'm not going to say there's not people that, I mean, I've even read some art. I've read some articles recently that still say that there's a lot of people that don't like this. I mean, nobody likes change like this, and this is massive change. From everybody wants that um, third, the the middle person involved in that, where that there's oh, there's a there's a group that bets all the information and then can present it to um, a group where that's what the traditional you know media companies do, and there'll always be a need for that. But the fact is is that we can talk directly to our fans, and we actually have a responsibility to do that. But we have to do it in a responsible way, and the way to do that is to hire people that really understand responsible storytelling. Who are those people? Journalists, uh, content strategists, content officers. They know that. So we're hearing content marketing director, chief content officer, of course, content strategists. Not as much the brand journalists over here, although we do. Um, you know, that term brand journalism is, is used by a number of people. But um, it's gaining a ton of momentum. I wouldn't say that we're to the point where we need to be, but I think that um, we're, we're not seeing colleges and universities embrace that yet, but we're starting to see it. We're right at the tip of seeing some real, real transformation, I think, in the educational process so that we're churning out of our universities people that understand the brand side as well as the, the media side of, of telling a good story. So... Um... A big time of change, as you, as you say. Um, is there somebody, a company that you you go, yeah, they, they've got it ab- absolutely right. Well, I I do li- I do like what Procter and Gamble has done. Uh, I mean, it's a big company example. They with the three examples that I that I talked to you before, they really understand quality storytelling. They're resourcing it. They they insource and outsource. Um, I think American Express has done a great job with American Express Open Forum. Um, I love that example. I mean, if you talk about a resource for small businesses, they've done an amazing job with it. Um, and then you have, I mean, car companies like Lexus has been, have been doing a great job with their uh, corporate magazine for a long, long time. I mean, that's an older form of, of content marketing. 
um, but they do fantastic. Uh, there are smaller businesses here that are doing some amazing things. OpenView Venture Partners, which is a VC company out of Boston, they have an in-house studio now. They have in-house video. They do podcasts. They do 24 pieces of fresh new content every week. This is a small company, mind you. So 24 new posts every week and really become the de facto re resource for entrepreneurs looking for funding, and that's who they're targeting. So my whole take is if there's a small company like uh, OpenView Labs can can make this kind of – and it's, it's by the way, it's changed their entire structure. It is is completely taken them to the next level from a, from a marketing and a business standpoint. So if a small company like that can do this, anybody can. I mean, and we've, you know, we're a small company, and we've been able to grow from zero to, um, you know, doing pretty well right now, and we've done that almost uh, exclusively through creating the, hopefully the best content around content marketing. So there's no barriers to entry when it comes to doing this, and I think that's what scares a lot of traditional media companies and larger companies. It's really a David versus Goliath scenario, but that's where large companies need to do this, small companies need to do this, and... Um, I, I, I think that we've never seen this kind of change before. So it's sort of exciting industry to be in as it, as it continues to go. And, um, and just, a really, just a side note, um, if, you, if your uh, audience is looking for really good examples, just type in 100 content marketing examples. We just put together an ebook of 100 content marketing examples. Of, so if you want more examples other than the ones I mentioned, uh, type it in and you can see it on Content Marketing Institute site. That's fantastic, and thank you so much for talking to us today. No, thank you so much. Exciting times. For more on the latest in digital marketing, or to learn more about Digital Chameleon's learning products and services, visit us at digitalchameleon.net or on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash digitalchameleon.